I'm pleased to give you my greetings. The greetings to the speakers, Father Augusto Zampini, Austin Ivory, and Paul Eli, good scholars, great friends. And to the many participants in this webinar dedicated to Pope Francis and the reform of the church. This is part of a series of conferences organized jointly by La Civiltà Cattolica and Georgetown University, two very ancient Jesuit institutions. I would like to briefly introduce this webinar by offering a simple and brief framework for the discussion. Pope Francis is a Jesuit Pope and his idea of the reform of the church corresponds to that of Ignatius. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. Ignatius was conceived that starting from the reform of one's own life and keeping one's eyes fixed on the poor and humiliated Christ, one could not but necessarily achieve a structural reform of the church. The reform is indeed a spiritual process that also affects by connaturality the ecclesial structure. One of the great inspirations of Monsignor Bergoglio, Pope Francis, is the Jesuit San Peter Feder, who uh, the scholar, the Jesuit scholar Michel de Certeau, simply characterized as the reformed priest, for whom the inner experience the dogmatic expression of faith and the structural reform of the church are intimately connected. Pope Francis is inspired by this kind of reform. The spirituality of Ignatius of Loyola is an historic, historic spirituality connected to the dynamics of history. Better yet, it is what drives history and organizes and gives shape to an institution. Bergoglio observes that in Ignatius' life is found the internal coherence of this project. But what is exactly Ignatius' project? It isn't a theoretical vision ready to be applied to reality, to force it in its parameters. It isn't an abstraction to be applied to reality. His project consists in making explicit and concrete what he had experienced in his inner world. In light of this, the question about what is Paul Francis's program does not make sense. The Pope has no clear and distinct ideas to apply to reality, but he proceeds based on his spiritual, spiritual experience and prayer that he shares in dialogue and in consultation with others. This procedure is called discernment. It is the discernment of God's will in our daily lives. Although it is fulfilled with the heart, the inner self, its raw material, is always the echo that daily reality reverberates in that intimacy, intimacy with God. It is an inner attitude that drives us to be open to dialogue, to the encounter with others, to finding God wherever he wants to be found, not only in narrow or well delimited and restricted confines. The task of the reformer is therefore to initiate or accompany historic processes. This is one of the fundamental principles of Bergoglio's vision. Time is greater than space, as he wrote in Evangelii Gaudi, his first apostolic exhortation. To reform means to start open processes and do not cut heads or conquer spaces of power. Francis is the Pope of processes, of exercises. The Pope lives a constant dynamic of discernment, which opens him to the future. It opens him also to the future of the reform of the church. For the Pope, 
the change of structures will not be as many actually as, uh, um, expect the result of reviewing an organizational flow chart. This would lead to an inert reorganization. The change must be linked to the dynamics of missionary work. It must be linked to current challenges. So the reform of the church has to be a radical missionary transformation of the church. To conclude, it must be said that for Pope Francis, the reform of the church is experiencing a strong and fruitful dialectic tension between spirit and institution. In his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, he wrote, the church has to accept this unruly freedom of the world, which accomplishes what it wills in ways that surpass our calculations and way of thinking. There is a dialectical and intra-ecclesial tension in Francis' remark regarding spirit and institution. One never denies the other, but the former must, must animate the latter in an effective, incisive way to counter the ecclesial introversion, as St. John Paul II called it, which is always a great temptation. Finally, worth noting is the fruitful tension between the church as a pilgrim people and as institution, which reflects two of Pope Francis' favorite definition of the church. That is also evident in the interview he gave to La Civita Cattolica in 2013. The pilgrim people of God, Lumen Gentium, and Holy Mother and Hierarchical Church, the definition um, that was created by San Ignatius of Loyola, uh, is preferred definition of the church. So the reform of the church for Francis is basically this, to ensure that the only mother, the hierarchical church, is always the pilgrim people of God. Enjoy our webinar. Thank you to all of you for being here with us today. Thank you, Father Antonio, for uh, your introduction and uh, for making possible this collaboration between La Civiltà Cattolica and Georgetown University with this webinar series on Questioni di Civiltà. So welcome everyone and a good morning. I am Deborah Tonelli, Georgetown representative in Rome. It's an honor and a pleasure today to present and to moderate this webinar on Pope Francis and the reform of the church. This is the second webinar after the first one in July on citizenship, cittadinanza, old in Italian language. The purpose of this webinar series is to stimulate reflections more than provide answer or theory. Today we will discuss Pope Francis and the reform of the church. Father Antonio already provided us the Pope's perspective and approach to the global issues, spirituality more than strategy. This spiritual approach changes the criteria and paradigm of our understanding of global problems and our research for solutions. COVID-19 outbreak stressed several old problems, but it is also giving us the opportunity to reflect on our priorities. Are they financial, economical, political, or rather is our priority the human being? What does the church's reform consist of? Reform is a very provocative word in the history of Christianity. We had a Protestant reform, but a greater reform in the history called the Church to her essence. That began by Pope Francis is probably much deeper than a structural conversion. In August, Pope Francis began a series of catechesis on the COVID-19 pandemic. 
focusing his attention on the dignity of the human being, putting her at the center of a new global narrative, one without a distinction for race, religion, or nationality. The global leadership of the Pope seems to me based on substitution of a particular interest, economic, political, financial, with a singular interest in human dignity. Today, three leading speakers will discuss the reform of the church in the frame of COVID-19. Before we start our discussion, I would like to remind the Q&I bottom in Zoom for questions from the audience. And I please my panelists to keep the timetable in order to make it possible to open the floor. At last, but not least, my special thanks to the staff at the Office of Vice President for Global Engagement. Yvonne Quick, Shi Meng Tong, Amy van der Vliet, and my thanks to the staff at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and the World Affairs, Ruth Gopin, and to the staff at the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, Anna Misle. So, my welcome to our speakers. I, I will present them briefly. Father Augusto Zampini is the adjunct secretary of the Dicastery for, for promoting integral human development. Before entering the seminary, he studied law at the Catholic University in Argentina. As a priest, he served in different parishes and institutions in Argentina and in England. His area of expertise is moral theology with a focus on economics and environmental ethics. He is an honorary fellow at Durham University, Roehampton University and Stellenbosch University and he lectures at different universities in Argentina and the United Kingdom. In 2016, Cardinal Tarkson invited Father Augusto to be the coordinator of development and faith at the Dicastery for promoting integral human development. And in 2018, Pope Francis appointed Father Augusto as one of the experts to the Synod of the Amazon in 2019. Our second speaker will be Paul Eli, he is a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and the World Affairs and the director of the American Pilgrimage Project. He also coordinates the Faith and Culture series sponsored by the Office of President. He has written about Pope Francis for The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Atlantic and The Vanity Fair. Before joining Georgetown, he spent 15 years as a senior editor with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux in New York. His works deal primarily with the ways religious ideas are given expression in literature, the arts, music, and culture in the broadest sense. And at last, but not least, Austin Ivory, his fellow of Champion Hall, University of Oxford, a writer, journalist, and commentator, and a co-founder of Catholic Voices. He is the author of the biography, The Great Reformer, Francis and the Making of a Radical Pope, and How to Defend the Faith Without Raising Your Voice. Both titles have been translated into many languages a former deputy editor of the tablet and the latter public affairs director for Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor. He has written widely on church affairs on the, the Francis Papacy for the Commonwealth, the New York Times, Crooks, American Magazine, Thinking Faith, and many others. So I thank you all of you for accepting our invitation and my welcome. So we can start now our first round of questions. And I'd like to start to address my first question to Father Augusto. Welcome, Father Augusto Zampini. 
I would like to know if, uh, in your opinion, uh, this global emergency can contribute to the reform of the Church and of the Vatican. Uh, good, yeah, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are, thank you. Um, thank you, Deborah, and thank you for the invitation. I think the, um, the question is not difficult to ask in itself because uh, the, the COVID-19 emergency is, is um, pushing the world, I mean, to a different scenario. I mean, things will change necessarily, uh, as the Pope said. So, and that means that we have to change, either for good or for ill. So we, we will emerge differently, that's for sure. And, and because the church is in the world, we are uh, not foreign to this challenge. So the church uh, needs to, re to respond to this emergency and crisis in a very radical way because it's a radical crisis. And it will emerge differently, for good or for ill. What does it mean? So how to address it? So the, the advantage that we have is the, the emergencies now, but we have to think in the long term. We have an advantage. So are we going to put all our transcendental view into our response or not? Uh, and if so, are we going, how are we going to do it and with whom? You know, These theological reflections, are we going to include other churches, other, other uh, religions and people of goodwill in general? I think the church has been doing that, but this will accelerate that reform that is part of Pope Francis' reform. No? The openness and the dialogue and this culture of encounter that Father Spadaro was saying. That's the first thing. The second I would say is um, what, what COVID-19 has also, is also pushing the church into refining its mission. So for example, this is something that we have to respond urgently, but it requires deep, deep reflection. And, it, and it's very complex, but it requires simplicity at the same time to propose solutions. And it requires, it's a new problem that requires new solutions, with new wine with new skins. Are we going, so all these things that the church has always been trying to respond to reality through the tradition of the church, well, how are we going to do it now when a tiny little virus is, is exacerbating the viruses, the enormous viruses that we have in terms of ecological crisis, social crisis, financial crisis, economic crisis, uh, lifestyle crisis, etc. So it's an opportunity for the church to bring, of course, the, the, the old wine of the tradition, but, but to express it in a new way and to put it into new skins uh, and to offer it, not to the church, but to offer it to the world. In that sense, the, the, I think that necessarily the COVID-19 will accelerate some of the reforces that of the reforms that Francis is, Pope Francis is proposing, uh, particularly through discerning together with others, because we don't have the solutions, uh, but contributing very strongly with our, the best of our tradition. We have a lot of things to say of what does it mean, what, what, what does it mean to live together in a global world? What does it mean to think in the long term? What does it mean to love our neighbors, our enemies, or because they are all affected by the virus? What does it mean to create a culture of encounter and peace? And what does it mean to address the deep crises that are uh, underpinning the, the, the COVID-19 that are basically the economic and the ecological crisis? And I think that the way we have to address this and how to respond it is part of the reform of the church. As I agree with what Father Spadaro said, it's not that the Pope has a Stalinist plan in reforming the church. It's that the church is part of the world and the world revolves, the church has to evolve. Of course, with the same basis of that, uh, that were settled by Jesus, but we cannot be the same institution in a different world. Uh, we need to, to be able to say something new because the word of God is always new. So thank you so much, Father Augusto. Uh, it's very interesting and it's important to highlight this idea of a process involvement and, and also tension between emergence and uh, at the same time, a, a deeper uh, reflection on these problems. And in some way, this emergency is pushing the whole world on different levels. So uh, thank you so much. But um, I, in some way, we can claim that uh, Pope Francis is uh, 
uh, is a revolution, is a reform, uh, is uh, in some way regarding uh, not only the church uh, as an institution or the Vatican as institution, but also the people uh, of God. So, uh, Polly Lai, uh, how are the Pope's actions and gestures creating uh, a new religious uh, imaginary and a new understanding of the role of the church in the world, which is the perception of the people of God. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for the question. I think that Pope Francis uh, has used images very, very effectively to convey not only a sense of the papacy and of the church in the midst of reform, but of Catholic Christianity at something like its essence over the past few years. Uh, when he was elected, the image that got the most attention initially was his refusal to live in the, uh, the Apostolic Palace. Instead, he would live in the guest house. This suggested a, a stripped down or simplified uh, papacy. And to a certain extent, that's been true. But that essentially, the, the negative character of the image, things he would not do, uh, quickly yielded to a, a positive character of things that he would do. And those, as I see it, have taken the character of the, the personalist uh, papacy, the papacy that's on a human scale. It's useful in this connection to see him in connection to his predecessors, uh, both of whom uh, had considerable ability to use images in the mass media, but they use them in different ways. John Paul, as I would interpret it, simplifying a bit, was a dramatic pope. He had a power for the grand gesture and uh, to speak to a large crowd, to give a sense of the global scale of the, uh, of the Catholic undertaking and, and to do that over a series of decades. Benedict was a scholarly pope. He uh, took great care to make sure that the church's positions were expressed uh, precisely in language and especially around the time of the millennium when there was lots of um, uh, unprecedented actions involving repentance and so forth, the codification of those uh, actions in words fell to Benedict. He was still Ratzinger at the time, but he was a scholarly pope. Well, Francis, I would say, is a personalist pope. He has his feet on the ground, he meets people essentially one-to-one, -one, and he is the pope who looks the whole world in the eye. Uh, we see this in some of the characteristic images of his pontificate. Uh, the embrace of a, a man with boils in St. Peter's Square, a modern-day leper. The uh, Pope unexpectedly going to confession at a penitential service in Rome. The Pope uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with other religious leaders at the um, 30th anniversary of the prayer for peace in Assisi, not putting the Pope uh, over against other leaders or up above them, but uh, them standing there as existential equals in, in this place uh, made so powerful by St. Fr Francis of Assisi. And we saw it in the events of COVID, uh, two events similar in some ways and different in others. Uh, he stood in St. Peter's Square at the worst moment of the pandemic in Italy by himself with uh, some of the ritual character of uh, Catholic events uh, over the centuries, but in a way that made us see the Pope as himself vulnerable and as exposing his own vulnerability at a moment when so many of us felt vulnerable. And then paired to that was the image of Francis walking on the Corso in, this, in those same days. The Pope as a city man who uh, feels confined by the pandemic and confined by his role as Pope and wishes to do nothing more than to walk down the Corso and, and say a prayer in a local Roman church. These are images of a personalist pope and are images of the human scale. Now, what does this mean for the reform of the church? People in Rome are pondering that. There's a reform of the Curia underway. And let's assume that uh, such reform as takes place will give us a reformed Curia on something like a more human scale. But as far as uh, for the, the people of God generally, what it does is reaffirm for us something basic to Christianity that is always in danger of getting lost, and it's the human scale. As I see it, that's what the incarnation, God becoming human, uh, 
perpetually reminds us of. The human scale is the scale. Uh, individual human lives, our sufferings large and small, the prospect of death, the hope of eternal life, these things rooted in every individual. Uh, we're not abstractions. We're not members of groups, finally. We're not um, sources for big data to analyze and, uh, and su suggest the way uh, we act based on um, mass behavior. We're individual free people responding to cues in our own lives. Uh, Francis, with his affirmation of the human scale, has served to remind us of that, and not only to remind us of it, but to make it attractive and possible. I think there's a feeling often, and there was certainly a feeling for me during the pontificate of John Paul, that Christianity, Catholic style, wasn't really possible. It, you had to um, set yourself count as a one man or one person counterculture to everything going around around you in order to be an authentic Christian. And Pope Francis suggested that uh, to live this way is possible and I don't want to say simple, but ordinary or normal and relatively straightforward. He's done it himself and he's made so many of us, myself for sure, want to do likewise. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for your explanation. It's very interesting uh, to see the Pope not only as uh, the, the presence of Jesus Christ and uh, the leader of the church, but a human being looking for a relationships uh, with the, the people of God. And in this way, involving, involving each one in these uh, wonderful relationships between transcendence and uh, humanity. It's, uh, it's incredible, really fascinating. But uh, also, uh, listening you and uh, Father Augusto, uh, I am understanding that maybe uh, the right word to express and to explain uh, the reform of the Pope is not uh, reform, but maybe conversion. And uh, on this point, I'd like uh, to listen the point of view of Austin. Um, what I am asking you is if the spiritual approach of the Pope Francis can transform the political approach to the global issue. It is just a structural reform or a spiritual conversion. What do you mean, Austin? Thanks, Deborah. Hello, everybody. Good to be uh, with you. Um, yeah, well, conversion, of course, was the subject of my new book that came out last year, which you didn't mention, Deborah, and I hope you don't mind if I just show it, because um, the, the subtitle, in fact, has the very word struggle there. And that partly reflects the fact that I had come to realize since writing my first book, The Great Reformer, that really what Francis was doing was much more akin to a process of spiritual accompaniment, a bit like in a retreat, a retreat director accompanies uh, somebody through a process of conversion. And it was Antonio Spadaro actually who helped me to, to understand that, that actually the real reform comes about when we no longer depend on the things that we think we need, power, uh, wealth, honor, and so on, but rather depend on the grace of, uh, of God, uh, that, that the true change happens. And that's true uh, personally, it's true ecclesially, and it's true in a, in a, in a wider sense. Um, I, I uh, perhaps rather boringly keep coming back to a great event, uh, which to me explains so much of this pontificate. And that was the meeting of the Latin American bishops at Aparecida in Brazil in May, 2007, when the entire Latin American Episcopate gathered for the first time in 25 years and carried out what I continue to insist have not yet been contradicted is the most far-reaching discernment of the signs of the times that had been done by any church anywhere in the world. And at the heart of that discernment was a diagnosis of where the church had, why the church was failing to evangelize contemporary modernity. And at heart, it was because of the trauma, in a way, or, or the tribulation of secularization uh, and the changes in society, which had caused the church in many ways to fall into a state of desolation, that it was spending more time lamenting and condemning 
than discerning and asking what is it that the Holy Spirit is asking of us in order to be able to offer the gospel at this time. So the diagnosis of a parasita was that, there, was that the church was in desolation. The prescription or the answer or what they heard the Holy Spirit saying was that this is a time for the church to re-offer the encounter with Christ as the starting point of conversion, that the church can no longer rely, and this is the key point, can no longer rely on Catholic structures as well as law and culture to transmit the faith. Therefore, the church had to do what the church always did at the beginning of Christianity, which was without the support of law and, and culture and, and great institutions, but to offer the experience of the encounter with the mercy of Christ, expressed above all in mercy and radical charity. And the, the, the idea of the universal dignity of humanity is all born there in the, in, in the concrete acts, if you like, of the church. So this is the, the famous Iglesia en Salida, sometimes translated as the outgoing church or extrovert church, but really in, it, it sounds be best in Spanish, the church that goes out. It's very simple. Now, how does the, this crisis, in a way, underpins all that? Well, of course, we are now living through one of the great breakdowns, one of the great traumas in Western, well, global indeed history, uh, this pandemic followed by what we all know is going to be and already is a massive economic crisis. Um, and that it is precisely in this context that everything I think Francis has been saying since the beginning of his pontificate encapsulated above all in Evangelii Gaudium. This is the moment that the church in a way demonstrates to the world precisely what it, what it did at the beginning of, of, of the Christian era. And to the extent that the church is with, is accompanying, is capable of diagnosing uh, and bringing hope and so on in this context, to the extent that the church is present in the pain and the suffering, particularly on the margins, to the extent that the church can reconcile and heal in a context necessarily of division, therein is the evangelization. You know. So to the, to the extent that, that this is the call on the church at this time, in a very radical and a very specific way, I mean, let me put it more simply, either the church, uh, I mean, the, the Pope's been saying, we will either come out of this better or worse. A crisis never leaves you the same. And exactly the same thing is true of the church. The church of the future, uh, so much will depend now on what happens over the next few years. And to me, that means in a way embracing uh, the reform, and I do use the word, the word reform, that Francis has been calling upon the church uh, these past few years, which obviously we can spell out and, uh, and unpack and describe in so many ways, but that I think is the heart of it. Thank you very much, Austin. So these are reform and these uh, attempt to evangelize the world is a, a big opportunity, not only within the church, but for all the world in order to find a new approach to solve the global issues, global problem, in investing poor people and different countries around the world. Uh, and, uh, but to continue our interview, uh, uh, I'd like to ask now to Father Augusto, uh, which are the, the new challenges of uh, your dicastery in managing uh, uh, this uh, COVID outbreak? Uh, which are the priorities uh, in a uh, in order to find a solution able to satisfy uh, all world, the whole world. Thank you, Deborah. Well, I think the the, uh, the dicastery now is in charge of um, of a commission that is called the Vatican COVID Commission, and um, and we have to work together with other dicasteries, with the Secretary of State. Uh, with local churches, uh, with other institutions uh, from the church and outside the church. So it's, it's quite a, a very big, um, I would say, global effort. But we, our aim is not to find these solutions because we don't, we don't know them in advance, but, but it is to help those who have to take the decisions today ha um, to take the best decisions they can because the decisions that they make today, whether you are in government, whether you are a leader of, of a church, whether you are a leader of a business or a labor union or 
a leader of a household, you have to take decisions now that will affect your future. So how to help the people who have to take decisions now is to take good decisions or the best decisions they can. Um, and this is one of our, of our challenges. And how to do it in, in alliance with science or in dialogue with science with agility, but also with this creativity and imagination that faith brings. No, for example, I mean, we were talking about churches. It's not, uh, well, all the, this impact that the COVID has had on the celebration of the sacraments. No, well, what is the, the what are the, the, the parish or the, or the bishops or the parish priests going to do or the parish community is going to decide? What does it mean all this new, um, uh, I would say, understanding of the virtual contact no, is it just virtual? Is, does this mean that it's not real? What, what, what part of reality affects us? What, does, what, what is the sacrament uh, or, or the grace of God embracing through this new way of relating ourselves? Um, things that ordinary people have, questions that ordinary people have from, can I confess myself through Zoom or what happens with the Eucharist if we, if we cannot gather together or, or, or when we gather together? So basically, how, how to create a, we have to acknowledge that at least in the near future, we have to promote communion uh, and union, but in a world that is asking for social distance, uh, because social distancing is necessary to, to keep uh, people health. So all these are challenges that we are, we are doing, but we, have, we are doing it in alliance, in, in dialogue, permanent dialogue with local churches, and how are they responding there? with experts in different fields, that means with science, with a, a, the entire dicastery for communication and groups of communication that can help us to communicate this, what we are doing, and also with governments and with international institutions. And we discover that nobody has the solution, but everybody wants the church to participate. Everybody believes that the church has something to say, and uh, through our spirituality, again, not the, because, what Austin said about Evangelii Gaudium, that is, we have to apply it now, is true. Because the, in the Evangelii Gaudium, the Pope, the Pope said very clearly, this is what, the, this is what the, I want the church to be in the, next, in the years to come. <laughs> and one of the things he said in Evangelii Gaudium, among many, is that the response to social problems, normally, what, what, what happened to those, those responses? People think, oh, this is the, the people who work in Caritas or experts or... Uh, no, no, the response to social issues is, is a mission of the entire church. Now, of course, of different levels, but the entire church, because, because this, as Paul was saying, this is, uh, is, um, is a consequence of the principle of incarnation. <laughs> God embracing the whole human nature, God embracing social nature, so we cannot be detached from that. Our mission as Christians cannot be detached, unless the entire church is not just a group of people. So, what is the level of participation to my contribution of this new world that is coming that we have to create to design to invent a new world and how are we going to contribute as christians so this is the challenge that we have basically to coordinate that as a dicastery not because we are going to do it eh? just a clarification but we we want to join forces to create synergy in how to take decisions that will enable us to be a more sustainable future uh, um, um, a society that of creates the possibility for actual encounters and, uh, and, uh, and implements the preferential option for the poor, no? because they have the, the, all the vulnerable or those in need uh, from the micro to the macro level, a society that creates the, uh, the conditions where we can uh, have a healthy society and not to live into a false dichotomy between shall we recover the economy or shall we allow people to, to die or to, well, how, this is a false dichotomy because what kind of economy do we want to create if people are ill? So, they, they, or again, shall we, shall we go back again to what we have before? Well, again, why don't we take this crisis as an opportunity to create something that we have, or to do something that we, have, we should have done some decades before? So, so to design a system that is not, that doesn't destroy or doesn't exploit people, doesn't destroy nature and creates this environment, this universal solidarity where we can have healthy people, healthy societies and, and healthy institutions that enable 
the, the health of people and societies. So basically, this is our challenge. No pressure, but, uh, but we have a lot of people helping us, a lot of people, but not just helping us, we have a lot of people who are participating in this, in this endeavor. Uh, and it's a, I, I think it's a, it, it would be a long term. We hope that the COVID won't last that long, but, but the society has to change if we don't want to have more COVID, if we don't have to address uh, a terrible or worse crisis than COVID. So this is the time to take, to, to, to make a change. And this is what the Pope has asked us. Please, this is the time. Don't, we, we there, there's, there's no, there's, there's nothing to, to lose and, and, and we cannot wait any longer. So thank you, Augusto. So in some way you are claiming that uh, it is uh, not too much important what the dicastery is doing, but uh, recognizing uh, that uh, the Pope's proposal is right, uh, what uh, I can do to support uh, his proposal. Maybe this is uh, uh, the true conversion uh, of, the, of the people, of God, uh, to be committed in first person in this journey to save our world and to make it uh, But a better Deborah, world. if I may, just a very short intervention there because I forgot to say yes and no, because I want to clarify uh, also in relation to what Paul said about human scale and the to create some delay. It's not just about what I can do, because one of the viruses of the world is individualism. We are, not, we are not individuals, we are persons in relations. So the solution for a new world cannot come from an individual, it will come from communities. And this is what the church is about. It's a community of people, of followers of Christ, not missionary disciples, <laughs> talking about Aparecida. So this is very important. The solution to, uh, to global crisis won't come from one individual. All individuals have something to contribute, of course. This is the the spirituality of Thierry Sarsoucier, everything has something to contribute. But if we don't do it as a community, there's no way out of a global crisis, of a communitarian crisis. This is very important. I'm sorry to say that because this is very important, particularly in some countries. <laughs> in some countries that they, they seem to, they, they don't understand that individuals are not isolated cells and that we thrive in community and we can always respond to common problems in community. This is and including the church, no, including the church. Uh, and that's why, I, sorry to, to point about this, but I really won't be happy if we think that, yeah, this is about what I can contribute. Yeah, you can contribute, but you as part of a community, as a house or as an institution or something, or as a church, but isolated efforts are not enough. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Augusto, for uh, uh, highlighting the, this uh, very important point, because uh, this changed uh, our point of view, not only in the individual perspective, but in communitarian perspective uh, and uh, in and the human uh, relationships. Uh, this is very, very important. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, but uh, um, Going to Paul, coming back to Paul Eli, uh, I'd like to know, uh, also in continuity with uh, uh, the words uh, of uh, Father Augusto, um, what is uh, happening uh, from uh, your point of view within uh, the peoples of God? Uh, which is uh, the perception? How, is, uh, the people, uh, how are the people perceiving uh, uh, the Pope uh, actions uh, to reform the church? Thank you for the question. Uh, of course, the people of God are divided. Uh, there, we can't speak uh, in a single generalization about what the Catholic people, even in one country, uh, think or, or what they're inclined to do. But some things can be said. Uh, Father Augusto framed the challenge at the moment um, uh, very succinctly. We are called to a culture of encounter at a time when uh, the pandemic is uh, asking us to keep our distance. Uh, this is the, the challenge of our moment. And I would say that when we look at Pope Francis' pontificate up to this point, we can be, be grateful that he laid up a store of images and examples that would sh show us how 
uh, culture of encounter is valuable and how, how it might be possible going forward. So before the pandemic, already Francis was suggesting in a way that didn't partake of the culture wars, how to offer a counterexample to dominant ways of doing things in our society. We have um, in global society, this is in many respects an age of the strong man, of authoritarian, would-be authoritarian rulers in Russia, in Turkey, in Hungary, in the United States, in Israel. Against this, Francis suggested that a person of great power, the Pope, could be an anti-strong man, could work uh, in ways that didn't involve authoritarian gestures, decrees, uh, the uh, use of power to uh, suppress the ideas of his rivals, or to uh, banish his enemies, but a culture of encounter even from a person uh, in a position of great power and leadership. Likewise, the images that he laid up uh, before the pandemic of encounter. During the interview that Father Spadaro uh, did with Pope Francis shortly after his election, uh, he, the image of the field hospital emerged. And that image has gotten a lot of attention because of the COVID epidemic. But right after that, uh, Pope Francis said, what's needed is nearness, proximity. And the seven years of his pontificate prior to the pandemic gave us images that showed us what nearness and proximity might mean. Where John Paul traveling around the world to a certain extent dramatized the global nature of the church uh, and who center is Rome uh, for him. Pope Francis on his travels suggested something rather different, that he would come to meet us where we live. We would meet us where we are. That the Pope drawing near is analogous for a God who wishes to draw near to each of us and who makes it possible for us in response to, to draw near to God. Now we're in a situation where so many of the things that enable us to draw near to one another, physical contact, meals, crowds at sporting events and uh, plays and concerts and the like are very difficult. Let's hope that if we emerge from the pandemic when we do with a, a heightened sense of nearness and proximity is very close to what makes us human. And we can do so partly because Pope Francis in his pontificate has affirmed that again and again already through his words and through the images that he's um, conveyed to the world of himself reaching out, drawing near. Thank you so much, Paul. And uh, okay, the people is divided, but in some way, uh, Pope Francis uh, became Pope uh, uh, for the election of Cardinal. So the Cardinals elected Pope Francis is a very particular figure, but uh, in, in some way is uh, the, the sign of our time. Uh, do you agree? Is it, sorry, is this directed to me or to Paul? Paul. I thought sorry. you were uh, posing the question to Austin. Can you pose it once more? Oh, no, sorry, sorry. No, I, I was uh, asking you if uh, that in, in, in some way uh, Pope Francis uh, is, uh, uh, was elected by cardinals. Uh, so uh, in, the people is divided. Uh, there, there is uh, some resistance uh, to, uh, to his reform and uh, to his style, but uh, uh, do you think that is uh, the, the man, the right man of our time for the church or, uh, or? <laughs> Myself, I most certainly do. I think the resignation of Pope Benedict and the possibility for Francis to emerge as the first Jesuit Pope, essentially as Bergoglio, as a Pope whose time and action as Pope is so consistent with so much of what he did beforehand and with a um, really astonishing, uh, um, he's thrust into public life on the grand scale and yet uh, does not himself seem uh, um, to be elevated to have lost this quality of having his feet on the ground. Is he the Pope for this moment? Uh, I've thought so since 2013 and I think so even more today. Let me just address something that circled around in Father Augusto's remarks though and then on the, on the chat. In suggesting that Pope Francis is the personalist Pope, or that he looks each of us in the eye, 
that's not to suggest individualism at all. And I know that, especially because I speak from the United States, a country where individualism run amok is partly what's led us to the particular um, grave situation we're in with the pandemic. Uh, Pope Francis, as a member of the Society of Jesus, as a member of our church in Argentina, as a member of the South American Bishops' Conference, as a cardinal, uh, in all these ways, he's affirmed membership in communities and his, his images of encounter, of nearness, have served to remind us of how interconnected we all are. And if we didn't realize it beforehand, we sure ought to realize it now because the pandemic has uh, made clear that biologically we're interconnected and our response to the pandemic um, lays bare just how much we depend on one another. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. So, Austin, I have a delay. Um, Deborah, you've gone quiet. You've muted yourself, I think. That's it. Sorry. Uh, I have a, the last question for you, Austin. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, this uh, spiritual approach of our Pope uh, is uh, contributing uh, to his uh, global political leadership? Uh, so, um, which is uh, your perspective? Yeah, I mean, as you'd expect me to say, I, I'd say yes, uh, unquestionably. I mean, his role um, is one of spiritual authority, and that's important to understand that it's a different kind of authority from the kind of authority that, say, a politician who is elected on a mandate would exercise. Um, and some of the frustration with Francis, I think, comes from uh, uh, an incorrect hermeneutic, as the theologians would say. In other words, we look at him with a particular lens. In reality, even though, of course, he makes law and he is the supreme authority in the church, um, ultimately his authority is the authority of Jesus. It's, it's the authority to persuade, to offer people a horizon, to build bridges that allow them to open themselves to the Holy Spirit, to grace. In other words, to set in motion um, processes which, if you like, allow God in uh, and change people's horizons. And that's... Uh, uh, that's fundamentally the, the, the task uh, of the Pope. Now, of course, there are a lot of structural issues in the church, and I know some of the questions uh, already uh, are asking about that. And, we, and by the way, I can talk for a long time about the structural reforms that have happened over the last seven years, uh, which I think actually have been far more substantial uh, than most people think. But I, I would, but I always come back to this, which is that ultimately what Francis is trying to do in Rome is to change a culture, a mindset. He's taking a bureaucracy or an organization which in many ways was built um, to defend itself from the world and trying to put it at the service of the world. And he uses this great distinction between a, being a mediator and an intermediary. A mediator is somebody who facilitates an encounter, in this case, of course, between God and humanity. An intermediary is somebody who interposes themselves in a way to profit at the expense of both parts. Middleman, we sometimes say in English. Now, I think what he's been seeking to combat in Rome and in the wider church has been what one might call a middleman or intermediary culture. Hence his war, and we have to call it a war on clericalism, uh, which he sees as absolutely the worst thing that can happen to the church because it's what happened, of course, uh, to Israel, you know, when you have uh, elite groups who try to arrogate to themselves, if you like, the power of religion rather than placing at the, uh, at the service of the people. So I think, you know, we can talk about the structural forms, but I think at the heart of what he's been seeking to do has been a transformation of culture. And he's been doing it in, I think, a very consistent, a very, um, a very radical way, a very determined way. But it's not all about, as Antonio, I think, was saying right at the beginning, it's not all about cutting off heads. It's not about sacking people. Uh, he allows people to retire and then appoints new people underneath. Uh, I mean, he, he, that's, his approach is much more long term. It's about sowing seeds that probably um, other popes will, you know, will harvest. Um, it's a very, very long-term process. If you simply change the structures without changing the culture, you achieve nothing. If you uh, change people without changing culture, again, you just support. So it's all about a gradual and much more organic process. But here's what I um, really want to say in answer to your question, Deborah, and this is picking up a lot on uh, what's been said already by Augusto especially, but also Paul about the culture of encounter, which is that um, setting in motion processes 
which allow people to come together and work together in many ways is Bergoglio's great speciality. Uh, he did his doctoral thesis on the whole question of how we can travel together in disagreement, allowing the tensions between us not to turn into contradictions, but rather to help to, if you like, bring the Holy Spirit in. Um, and he's a, I think he's a bit of a genius at this. And of course, what he sought to do in Rome is introduce through mechanisms of synodality processes which actually allow this. So if you want to know where's the real action in this pontificate, it's been in the synods. And by the way, also the place, of course, where the greatest opposition to this pontificate has also been felt. Why? Because the, synod, the heart of the synodal process is discernment. It's about allowing the Holy Spirit to guide the church. It's about bringing people together who have very different views, asking them to express themselves clearly, and boldly and then listen to each other very carefully and then to detect the motions of the spirit which allow uh, everybody to look in a if you like in a third place which is beyond those co uh, contra contradictions or differences now this he's doing for the sake of the church but i think above all he's doing it for the sake of a humanity which is increasingly polarized and divided so he, here's the thing i mean you guys in america at the moment are going through uh, an election, you're coming up to an election and revealing as ever, ever deeper tribal divisions, a polarization which is deeply affecting the church as well, which is inducing a paralysis. The solutions which face the world and the church will never, can never be solved when uh, the, the body itself is completely divided. If this is not dealt with, then in a way we all fail. And so I think what Francis is doing, often in a very gentle way, is offering mechanisms, uh, models, um, for how we can live together in disagreement, but actually turn those disagreements into something fruitful that, that allow us to work together. And, and uh, this is really the, 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 the whole point about the body and the people of God, that God comes into, he, 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 the incarnation is God entering human history to form a people, to create a body, which isn't about eradicating differences, but allow, allowing them to work together against a shared horizon. And that's what opens up a new future of hope. So thank you very much, Austin. But uh, my impression uh, uh, hearing you is that uh, this, uh, this approach to disagreement uh, uh, would be fruitful uh, even out of the church uh, and not only within uh, the, the Catholic Church. So my impression, uh, um, listening to you and uh, uh, Augusto and uh, uh, Paul Eli, is, is that in some way um, this Pope uh, is a model uh, for, uh, a problems, for problem solving and for creating a, a new kind of a global world. This I mean, is my impression. It's about, it's about creating a new kind of politics, which is much more about the engagement of ordinary people from their institutions at the base of society. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's about um, allowing the energy and the creativity of, of what he would call the popular movements or the people's movements to actually become, uh, to bring about change. In other words, it's not just about the state, it's not just about the next great leader who we think will solve everything. Um, yeah, it's about restoring the, the pre-liberal, if you like, idea of politics as the cultivation uh, of virtue and the engagement of people in, in the common good. Different kind of politics, and then, you know, and Augusto is very good on this, a different kind of economy, where the goal is not simply the growth in GDP, which we know excludes half uh, of the world's population from the benefits of the goods of the world, but also damages the environment. Can we have an economy with different kinds of goals, which are human goals? You know, how do we flourish better? How do we make sure the poor have enough without damaging the planet, which involves changes to how we all live? But who has the courage to offer those kinds of models of conversion, if not Francis, the church at this time, because frankly, nobody else is doing it. Yeah, th thank you so much. Uh, so we, now we have the time uh, uh, to open the floor because uh, we have uh, really several uh, questions from uh, our audience. Uh, of course, it will be impossible to answer to everyone, but uh, uh, Thank you very much, everyone, uh, to attend this uh, 
this webinar and thank you for uh, your questions. Um, so, um, I, I can uh, choose uh, some questions. Uh, okay. Um, one question uh, probably for uh, Austin uh, from Mark Kirken. Doesn't the reform of the church have to come from the people of God rising up, rather from the topic hierarchy down? Francis can inspire us as a people, but we have to take up the cause, much like Black Lives Matter. Austin. Yeah, well, I'm not sure that changes will come through an uprising of the people. I'm not sure uprising uh, is necessarily the word we're looking for, but certainly the participation and engagement of the people of God, which is also what synods are about. I mean, you know, it's easy to say, well, synods just involve bishops because they're the only ones who vote. But actually, synods involve a very long process prior to the actual synod opening of consultation of the people of God. We had that with the synods on the family and indeed young people and Amazonia last year. I mean, a two year process of consultation of dialogue and so on. So there are lots of uh, ways in which the people of God engage, need to engage in this process. But synodality, as Francis has himself said, needs to permeate the whole church. It's not just about those meetings <laughs> our diocese, our parishes, our bishops' conferences need to become much more synodal, uh, much more about uh, 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 people being able to participate and dis contribute to a discernment. But we're not talking here about democracy because the synodal process, ultimately the bishops have that authority to discern them. But, but you know, as Francis says, and I've forgotten what, what this is in Latin, but it's something like a, a teaching church must be a listening church. You know, we can, the church will not be effective in teaching unless it first listens. And so that's what the synod uh, is, is also about. Uh, and uh, maybe this is um, a way to overcome clericalism, this new approach, uh, a church listening. Uh, well, well I, absolutely. Uh, I mean, clericalism, uh, by the way, Clericalism, by the way, is, is, is not just the vice of clerics. Uh, lay people can be clerical as well. Clericalism is an aristocratic mentality. It's whoever puts themselves above the people of God, sees themselves as separate from it. Uh, and I'm afraid there are no shortage of uh, elitist <laughs> lay people. We have them on the left and on the right in the church who spend all their time uh, you know, judging and writing long blog posts, denouncing everything. Uh, so we all need to overcome this. So we have to start to believe, as Ignatius puts into the spiritual exercises, you know, we have to believe in the church as our own mother. We have to care about her, suffer with her uh, in order to really participate. Well, thank you, Austin. Now we have another question from Jack Ambene to Polylife for Polylife. And the uh, Given the general ignorance of Catholics about the basics of their faith, such as the principle of Catholic social justice, could technologies such as Zoom, um, as Zoom that are now mainstream become a platform for re-evangelizing the faithful on a large scale? This is very interesting because, uh, okay, so Paul. <laughs> Well, so first of all, the question is, takes as a given the general ignorance of Catholics. I'm not sure I would go along with that given altogether. Uh, there's always somebody in the church saying that somebody else is ignorant. Uh, people of simple faith have maintained the church for centuries. Uh, so I, I, that's not a, a constructive way of opening as far as I'm concerned to take as a given the ignorance of, of others. That's certainly not the way Pope Francis has approached things. So um, setting that aside, uh, of course, we can use new media to help communicate. We're doing it now. We have in Father Spadaro, someone who's thought about the social uh, networking of the internet on a theological level and the way it um, decenters hierarchical structures in ways that could be really fruitful for the church and uh, fruitful for uh, the drawing near that we're trying to do uh, in, in context of what I said earlier about the, the essential thrust of Francis pontificate. Will we do it? Uh, I hope so. I guess I think the um, going back to one of my earlier points that the, the challenge for 
the next generation of people who would evangelize has to do more with c communicating the the beauty and the ardor of living as a Christian uh, faith that will then seek understanding. I don't think the problem is lots and lots of Catholics who are ignorant. I think it's fewer and fewer people who really want to be Catholic. And I would think that Pope Francis, with his use of images, his suggestion that complicated as Christianity it is, it, it um, can be essentially uh, simple about drawing near to to a person on the margins, that's a better place to start than with um, Zoom catechism or something like that. Well, thank you so much, Paula. Uh, we have another question for uh, um, Father uh, Augusto Zampini. Uh, will the spiritual conversion promoted by Pope Francis uh, lead to specific institutional changes in the church, including uh, revisions of traditional theological dogma? Uh, this is very interesting because uh, sometimes the public debate uh, speak, uh, talk about uh, uh, some uh, theological, um, some changing in the doctrines and so on. And maybe uh, this uh, question uh, give you, Augusto, the opportunity to solve uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, situation, please. Well, I, I, uh, not sure because the dogmas are what we believe that is you know, a discovery of the the truth that uh, is expressed in the gospel and we have discovered afterwards. So uh, that's very difficult to change. But there are lots of things that we teach in the church that are not necessarily dogmas and that we have dogmatized them. No? Um, and that could be the case. But certainly, uh, certainly there are two things about the, that question that I would like to, to, uh, to stress. One is that it was very well spotted. The, the change that we need in the world to address the mega economic ecological crisis that we have, which is also political, is also uh, health crisis, but the, the changes that we need to, to make in the way we live, the way we produce, consume waste, we design politics, is so, so deep, or so, so wide, so, so big. There's no way that it can be done through our it, it, can, it, that the, it can come only from what we think, from our brain. It needs to come from here, from the guts, from the spirit. Not just because there are, very, because there are the, the deep roots, but also because that the, the, when it's at spi the, the spiritual force is the driver for change, that's the only way of sustaining it in time. Otherwise, as soon as you have difficulties, you will drop it as the parable now of the of the seeds, no? Well, as soon as the sun comes, it's too difficult, but when, when, it, when it's really, really deep down below here, there's nothing that will stop us. And, and also when it's a community, that, that spirituality is shared in a community, there's nothing that, that, that will stop us. And that is something that, for example, we will address uh, next year for the, in the COP26 with different religions. We are going to arrive there uh, and to say to the nations, listen, I know that you are you want to implement the sustainable development goals and you know we are struggling but you know what we religious people we have already we are already we have already started and we are not going to stop <laughs> whether whether you agree or not we are going to change anyway so so I, we are going to support you if you continue the change and otherwise be careful so this the, the spiritual change is very very important because it, it provides the driver and the sustainability for change because it's an ongoing change remember that we don't convert in an overnight. No, it's a process of conversion, as Father Spadaro was saying at the beginning. So this is the first thing that I would like to say about that question. There. And thank you so much for raising it. The second thing, would, it's more related to, of course, where, this, where the spirit blows, as in discernment, as Austin was saying, then we discover new things about what, what Christ wants, wants to tell us. No? Uh, but, but, Related to the question that was posed to Paul, uh, on, there's a, um, a famous book, I mean, it's an old book actually, from the 80s, that is called, the title of the book is Catholic Social Teaching, Our Best Kept Secret. <laughs> no? So, and 
And for those who are not that intellectual, I will, I will give you a very, very short story. So, so last, last year, somebody asked a priest, I wouldn't say who, to go and, 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 and give a talk in Spain about Laudato Si, the encyclical of the Pope and the care for our common home. And so I said, oh, but are you going to, to do like Augusto? Because I, I, I heard Augusto, Father Augusto speaking about this in different audiences in Kenya, in, in, in Sierra Leone. And the priest said, mm, I'm not sure. I'm going to talk about Jesus. Like he was implying, like, well, if, because I speak about Catholic social teaching, I'm not speaking about the church and the faith. It has nothing to do. I'm not speaking about Jesus. As if Jesus, if you analyze the gospel, he speaks 80% of his speeches of parables of time are related, are relating the kingdom of God with social issues. So I think one, so the good question, the good opportunity that this question provides is to say, listen, uh, the Pope, what, what is the Pope doing now, now, right now, is doing a series of catechesis about the response of the church of the COVID based on Catholic social principles and theological virtues. And this is a catechesis. So, of course, he, he's not going to sort out and to create new thinking, but he's, he's providing an example of what our, lo what our small churches and local churches should do uh, to use the best of our tradition, including the social principles of the church, no? taking the gospel and the tradition and, and the theological virtues, but, but to say what has got to, to say now to the people who are who has lost their jobs, to the people who are sick, to the people who, who have relatives who have died and they cannot assist the funerals, who, who those who, are, who have lost their company, who those who, who are completely anxious because they, they don't know what's going to happen in the future, who those who are locked down in a horrible household and they cannot escape, who those who, who are giving up their life and not, they're not recognized. I mean, has, is God not, has God nothing to do or has God nothing to say about that? I'm sure, of, of course he has. And of course the church in the name of God has something to say. So this is what the new catechesis is, is, is a more dynamic catechesis where the social principles of the church are not just for experts and explaining boring things about the history. It's about the, the right now, the spirit of God, I mean, really, really among us now and helping us to respond to, to provide not solutions, because this is, this is the thing, this is the key, is to provide responses, a process of responses, to provide fruits with, with our love, with our hope, no? with, our, with our faith to the world, and to offer these processes to the world, not being a church that is self-centered, which in, to, 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 to sum up, this is part of the reform, according, in my opinion. The church cannot be self-centered. The, self, the church is at the service of the kingdom of God, at the service of, of the world. And this is what every single crisis is, although it's terrible, provides an opportunity to re rejuvenate this, to regenerate our service to the, to the, to the kingdom of God, to the, to the world, which includes, of course, the preference to those who are suffering. Um, who, I mean, I, would, I love to be part of a church. I'm already enthused, but by, by, by even by the by way of explaining it, you see, a church that is, has this strength to help somebody, especially the poor, in the name of, of our faith, in a sustainable way. Well, I'm already excited. You see, this is, this is, this is I think, is the new the discernment, dynamic conversion process that has been accelerated, I would say, by the pontificate of Pope Francis. Hasn't started with him, but he has he's made a big push. Thank you so much, Augusto, for your explanation. Um, I have the last question for uh, everyone uh, of you, uh, and I'd like uh, to know your opinion, your idea about the difference between uh, uh, criticism and the resistance, because uh, uh, <laughs> each pope was uh, criticized, and uh, everyone is criticized uh, every day. Okay, we can do something, and someone else, uh, of course, claim that we can do better uh, and uh, to test uh, to, to prove that uh, we can do better and so on. But uh, 
Uh, in the case of uh, the reform of the church engaged by Pope Francis, uh, it seems to me that uh, we find uh, a sort of a resistance. So um, let me know, please, uh, maybe beginning with you, August, uh, or uh, Augusto, or with Paul, uh, and after Austin, uh, this uh, difference between uh, resistance and the criticism uh, against the Pope. Which one of us would you like to speak first? Yes, thank you. Um, let me begin at the end. I think there's active resistance to Pope Francis taking place in the United States. In part, that's a way to speak to the question that um, Father Augusto took up. Basically, we, have, uh, we don't have a situation in which the Catholic people are ignorant uh, and Catholic social teaching is a well-kept secret. We have a situation in which not a small number of American bishops have sidled up to a president and a party uh, who are flagrantly in violation of Catholic social teaching. We have the same bishops and many others who've basically resisted reform on priestly sexual abuse uh, for three decades. These are people with long habits of resistance that is for them coextensive with the work of the church is resisting liberalizing trends in the culture and anti-authoritarian uh, structures and activities. So the fact that Pope Francis is now undertaking such activities, uh, this isn't reform that we're seeing uh, in the pushback from the American bishops. Uh, it's active resistance. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I, I, would just use the, I would just use the terms that Pope Francis himself uses, which is to say, that when there is, uh, that there's nothing wrong with criticism. Criticism is perfectly normal and ordinary, uh, and everybody should feel free to criticize. Resistance is, there is a bad spirit behind it in the sense that you are, what you're doing is denying, in effect, Francis's authority, his spiritual authority. You're denying that he's guided by the Holy Spirit. You're denying that he was uh, elected by a process which is open to the Holy Spirit. Um, and so those people who talk about you know, Francis as a heretic or a modernist or, uh, or, or they just claim that, you know, he's trying to change the fundamentals of the church. I mean, all that is an example of, of resistance because these are people who are in effect denying um, his authority. And the origin of that is a schismatic mentality, whether it leads or not to schism uh, is to be seen. Um, every papacy has had very strong resistance whether it's from the extreme left or the extreme right, or sometimes from particular uh, groups with particular vested interests. What's very um, interesting about this pontificate is that the heart of the resistance is, as I think I said earlier, to discernment. Whenever Francis is discerning, that's when you find the greatest resistance, which is why the synods have elicited uh, real resistance, real what I might call bad spirit resistance. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Austin. You. Augusto, tell me. Yeah, I am um, following up with what Austin said. Um, the, the dialogue is part of the culture of encounter that Pope Francis is trying to promote. So, so those who are able to dialogue the problem is the, the, the ideology behind that and the, the mix, with the, the confusion between our religion and our, and our ideology. You know? And the same happened to, I mean, analogically speaking, as an analogy with differences, no? but the same happened to Jesus uh, when he was talking about the kingdom of God and the people were saying, no, no, that's not, that, that, that's not the, well, yeah, I mean, well, why not? Show me how. <laughs> so, so, uh, so the resistance comes from, from deep, from misunderstanding, I mean, I'm going to say, because I agree with Paul to a certain extent, it's not a misunderstanding, it's, it's, it's a confusion, I mean, between your faith and an ideology. And it's a fear, I mean, fear is never a good driver. So, what, this is going to destroy the church, what? I mean, the, the church is, it's not going to be destroyed, the basis of the church are there, and <laughs> they're going to change. But, uh, so, but the, 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 the discernment is that the church is alive, it's a lively community, led by the Holy Spirit with a certain structure. Uh, so um, what, what is interesting is that many of the groups who are quite belligerent and resistant were those who beforehand, they, they were saying, they were accusing everybody of being heretic because they were 
just giving an opinion that maybe that's not exactly right. And now they're, they're saying that the Pope is heretic. I mean, I, I uh, so in, in, there's a famous um, book in a Spanish book, I guess like a kind of Shakespeare's, uh, but for Spanish, they say Don Quixote de la Mancha, no? or Miguel Cervantes. And Don Quixote is with, uh, no? Um, on, on, on his way with Sancho Panza, which is his, his mate, and on his horse, and then so the, 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 the dogs are barking, no? and, uh, and Don Quixote said to, the, to his mate, and Sancho Panza said, uh, in Spanish, he said, Ladran Sancho, señor que cabalgamos. So Austin, can, can, you can help me to translate that. <laughs> How would you dogs, say it? The dogs are barking, Sancho, which is a sign we're moving ahead. Exactly. <laughs> and that's a perfect synthesis, you see. We are moving ahead. The churches were ahead based on the grounds of our faith, on what on the kingdom of God. And well, and there will, there will always be dogs that bark, and that's a good sign. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and maybe we have time for a, a very last, last question uh, for you all. Uh, um, about a more responsibility for lay people. How do you see people being enabled and they given the authority to do this? Um, so the, issue, the question is about the responsibility for, um, for lay people. So, uh, Paul Eli, do you like to, be, to start? <laughs> so, one of the things that Pope Francis has done is to draw near to people from different walks of life. He's drawn near to gays and lesbians. He's drawn near to transgender people. He drew near to the atheist Scalfari with some long interviews. Uh, I would say that the best way for him to move things forward is to draw near to lay people by giving them positions of authority greater than they've occupied to this point. It's partly structural and whatever reform of the Roman Curia is taking place, let's hope that there are more roles for lay people in it. But he can use the symbolic power of saying, I draw near to this person as, as a true Catholic, uh, as serious as any cardinal or bishop, uh, this person who is a woman or a lay, lay man or a young person. Uh, and let's hope that uh, he, he, he keeps doing that. Uh, thank you, Paul. Austin, please. Yeah, sure. I mean, I just, um, I just think that, that Francis is quite sensitive to clericalism, even, you know, in the way that lay people think. Um, and a lot of the discussion around this turns about on power. And, and ultimately, power, of course, is, is clericalism, isn't it? I mean, in other words, all leadership roles in the church are about service, whether they're ordained or non-ordained. One of the interesting things that's happened in the last year was the Amazonia Synod. And one of the very striking things about that synod was how in this vast area where there are very, very few priests and the church has very little infrastructure, it is lay people and mostly women who run the church communities in the Amazon. And there was a lot of discussion in the synod about ordaining married men and about uh, women accessing the diaconate. And Francis says, you know, felt that that's not where the spirit was. Where the spirit was, was about affirming, raising up, recognizing the authority that is already exercised, the leadership that's already exercised uh, by lay people and especially women uh, in the church. In other words, the spirit has already, as it were, called forth the gifts that the church needs uh, for its mission. And I think where, where Francis is looking there, again, in quite a gentle way, it's only one part of the world. But read Querida Amazonia, but particularly that last section, and you cannot but think, well, actually, this is what we should be doing. You know, the whole church really needs to be recognizing in, in, a, in a very new way um, the, the gifts that are being poured out on, on everybody, you know, uh, lay people as well as religious uh, men as well as women. There have been a lot of questions I've noticed specifically on women, and I'm sorry we didn't get round to it, but can I just say very briefly, that one of the things Francis has been doing in the Vatican has been integrating the voice of women by, yes, appointing them leaders of dicasteries, giving them senior roles in dicasteries, but that's more important, appointing them consultors, 
Just a couple of weeks ago, he renamed the Council for the Economy, which is an incredibly authoritative body, and six out of seven of the lay people are all women. But they're not working in the Vatican for the Vatican. They come from outside to give their advice uh, and their counsel. And I think here you see there's a lot of uh, what he's been doing with women. He's been trying to say, we need to integrate women in the voice of women, but be careful that we don't clericalize them or allow certain kinds of women to support particular power structures, which we need to move on from. Well, thank you, Austin. Augusto, please, uh, last word about this topic, lay people. Well, I think... Um, I will give you some, again, uh, um, um, I will tell you some, my experience. You know, uh, so it's not just what I think. So seeing, I arrived um, to the Vatican three years ago. And so my, one of my first tasks was to be advisor to the Synod for the Youth. And we have a pre-Synod for the Youth. And I was, I think we were only two, three, four, five priests among 350 lay young people <laughs> and more than more than 60 percent 65 percent were women uh, so that was my first experience <laughs> and somebody told me well but hold on a minute this is new eh? this is new huh? <laughs> because i don't think that this is normal <laughs> so but that was three years ago then then we had the synod for the use and they were um for the first time a lot of for the, for the synod of family I was not here but there were some lay people participating but then for the synod of the youth they were, we have the pre-synod of the youth, but then there were young people participating in the synod that was created just for bishops. And then in Querida Amazonia, there were, I, I cannot say the number, but there were a lot of number of lay people there, including indigenous people, in the, the synod hall alongside bishops. So, uh, and, and again, the more you link faith with reality, uh, the more obvious the role of lay people is. Uh, and, uh, and, and the more we need them. Uh, and, but I don't think, I, I, I would be a bit cautious and say it's lay people or, or clerics or, because we need, uh, no, it's like St. Paul said, we need all the charisma in the church. That, that's again, I will finish, my last word will be, again, the sense of community. In a community, it's like a body, we need every single charisma. We cannot be one or the other. I think this is also another false psychotomy within the church. Now I mentioned the false psychotomy in the world of health and economy, but I think uh, clerics or lay people, well, we need to work together. I mean, uh, this, is, this is not one or either. I mean, we all have something to contribute and so long as it is for the service, as, as Austin was saying. And uh, this is what, I mean, Evangelii Gaudium is very, very clear. The Pope said, okay, this is the church I want. <laughs> uh, and some of us are trying to work on that uh, with all our imperfections, of course, and mistakes. But, but this is what we're trying to do, to, to generate a community of people, lay, clerics, women, men, young, old, but a community of followers of Christ. And, um, and I think um, uh, this is the way forward. And to be honest, I don't think there's um, there's road back in, in this in this part of the reform i think we will continue to work here for the years to come so thank you very much thank you all of you we we began uh, um, our webinar uh, uh, with the idea to speak about the pope francis and the reform of the church uh, and after we discuss his uh, spirituality and the, the role of the uh, is a spirituality in the reform of the church and uh, in the reform of global politics, but also in the reform of the people of God. Uh, of course, the questions and the issues uh, are too much, but uh, it's a pleasure to be, uh, for me to, to thank all of you, uh, our speakers, uh, Augusto Zampini, Paul Ilai, Austin Ivory, and the whole staff uh, um, of the Berkeley Center Initiative uh, for a Social Catholic uh, and um, Global Engagement. So thank you so much. We will have a, a third webinar in Italian language on power uh, on the 17th of September.
and uh, I wish you a, a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Deborah.